I gotta mm-hmm. say, vocally, if Winona Judd and Travis Tritt had a kid. Oh, oh, that's you. I love it. Oh my <laughs> God. He was my mind. I'm gonna tear up. I love that. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this episode of Bored and Curious. I'm your host, Mary Katz, and today's guest is country artist Dallas Remington. And y'all, this girl can sing. She's so good. She has a very sassy song called Princess that recently came out, as did the music video. Before we get started, I wanted to make a note that if you are listening to this on a podcast platform, thank you. But know that I also upload full episodes and individual clips to YouTube. Also on YouTube, I do what I call comment prompts. I put text in the videos asking you guys to participate along with the video. So for example, if I ask a guest, what's the worst thing you did as a kid? I may put that text in the video as well. So you can answer that in the comments below. All righty, let's get started. All right, Dallas, welcome to Bored and Curious. I am excited to have you here today. So um, you you do have a new song coming out. I'm sorry, it just came out. You have a new song Mm -hmm. that just came out called Princess. And, yes. and b- before we get into that, I do want to go over just a few kind of some industry questions and about your upbringing. You live in Nashville now, but originally you're from Kentucky, right? Yes, I'm from Paducah, Kentucky. I'm a fifth generation farm kid, um, grown up um, farm faith and family has been my entire life. But, you know, we I started doing music when I was 10 and um, started coming to Nashville when I was 11 to play shows here. And um the opportunities just kept on coming and every door just kept opening and we ended up moving here when i was 15 my mom and i did um left my daddy and my brother in kentucky to support our habit as we say and um the habit slowed down ever since that's incredible to have like to know that you know um that you wanted to be a singer that early because uh, mm-hmm. most people, you know, most kids go, I want to be a nurse or a teacher or, you know, a lawyer, or whatever, you know, comes baseball player. It, but you, you kind of keyed in pretty early. Like yeah, enough to well, move. I, yeah, I always loved music and it was just kind of, you know, we're a very faith-based family and it was just one door kept opening after another that was pointing us in this direction and pointing me towards music. And um, I've been so blessed and had a bunch had so many amazing experiences here in the industry and we're just excited for more and we're just going to keep going going till there ain't no more open doors (laughs) i don't think those doors are ever going to close like (laughs) you have an incredible voice oh thank you so much um so do you remember the first song that you wrote yeah um it was actually a really violent one my mom had me read it it was called right back for the kill um But yeah, I, we rewrote it. I kept playing that one. Actually, I wrote that when I was 13. Um, I kept playing it for up until I was probably 18. Um, and then, you know, I just been writing so much that, you know, songs phase out, but I think we, I don't know if we ever recorded that one. I think we have a demo of it somewhere, but no one is ever allowed to hear it. Um, but I rewrote it and it was just called right back. And it was just about a boy, you know, that just kept coming back and hurt you no matter what. You know, because what else do 13-year-olds know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but yes, I definitely still remember that. I couldn't play it, but I remember the song. That's awesome. 13. I'm trying to imagine your mom going, what? what? Yeah, she was like, that's, that's a little that's a little violent. Like, can you not say kill? And I was like, but that's what he's doing. <laughs> it's He's like, uh-uh. Yeah. Let's, let's, let's take that out a little. <laughs> like, mom, calm you, yourself down. Mom, calm you down. taught me honesty. <laughs> Just put it into words <laughs> on paper. Exactly. <laughs> so what do you wish you knew before making the move to Nashville and like seriously pursuing it? Is there, what kind of surprised you along the way? And you were like, Ooh, that would have been great to know. I was very blessed to have only grown up two hours from Nashville. Um, so I, we drove it back and forth multiple times a week. We were here already. Um, so I don't think there was any like huge surprises once we already once we moved here. You know, the biggest things to me is I'd never had neighbors and I moved into an apartment building. That was the oh. biggest like learning curve for me. It's like, oh, you have people all around you. I can't. Uh. <laughs> um, but you know, like I said, growing up two hours from here, it was I was here mm-hmm. already, and um, you know, the city has changed a lot since I started coming here when I was a little girl, but. You know, just trying to adapt to the city. I think one thing that 
you know, coming here so young that we didn't realize would be a thing is um, some venues don't let you play until you're 21. Oh. So there's venues that I've just now started being able to play because I just turned 21, you know. But we made do and we played everywhere else and I played around the country. So um, I was able to do it. But, you know, now Whiskey Jams, it's able to play it if we get there. <laughs> Wow. I, um, that would be surprising to like try to pursue that career. And then some venues are like, mm, you need to wait yeah. a few more years. I know. And even then, like, you know, when I started driving, wanting to go to shows and see people play, I couldn't because I couldn't get in the venue. Wow. And that never really made sense to me because it's college town. Most of the kids here are 18, 19, 20. Mm -hmm. So where are we supposed to hang out? But I've made it. I've crossed that threshold now where I can go wherever I want now. Right as rain now. <laughs> and enjoy the music. <laughs> so is there someone in the industry who you haven't worked with yet, but you really want to? Oh, uh, there's like a oh, list. Yeah, there's yeah. So I mean, I'm not, gonna, I'm not going to put a limit on you here. If you've got three, <laughs> if you got 17, girl, just rattle them off. Yeah, I mean, just being um, in town as long as I have. Um, I've learned, you know, the songwriters. I've learned the managers, the producers, you know. On the songwriting side, my all-time goal is to write with Jeffrey Steele. Like, I want to write with him, him, Tony Mullins, all of the, the Music City hitmen, as they used to be called, or Music Row hitmen. I just love them. So him, Tony Mullins, Craig Wiseman, all of them on the writer's side. And then on the label side, I'd love to work with Craig Wiseman as well, because he has an absolutely amazing re record label that's blowing everything out of the water right now. And, um, you know, there's just... There's people that even behind the scenes people wouldn't under wouldn't know, but artist wise, people I'd love to work with. I mean, like, gosh, like Garth would be like my all time. Like, if I got to do anything with him, I would be set just because one be in the room with one of my heroes. But then to have him have any input or have any advice he could give me would just mean the world to me. And then also, I mean, it would be great to sit down with Loretta Lynn. Um, one time I just talked to her about the industry and see how she's learned because um, she's one of my one of my musical Mount Rushmore people mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that of course. I would just love to have some input from her. Gotcha. No, that's, that's that is a very, very good list. <laughs> yeah. Um, so what would you say your ultimate goal is? In the industry? Some people are going to say, you know, opera membership. Some say, you know, sell at an arena mm -hmm. tour. You know, what would what would yours be? Yeah, mine is just to, you know, to play music and make a living doing it and be able to share my music with the world. Obviously, sub goals, like, I mean, the ultimate goal along with that is to play the Grand Ole Opry. And then after that, you know, become an Opry member. But, you know, when I started this, I just wanted to be able to travel and play music and um, ultimately try to, to heal people or help people with my music or just, you know, make them feel anything. Um, so that's my goal is just to be able to, to play the songs to people around the world. Absolutely. That's a, it's a good goal. Um, so let's move into the story behind the song. Your most recent release is Princess. Woo, yeah. girl, that's a sassy song. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead and tell me the story behind that one. Yeah, so Princess was written with one of my best friends, Ms. Nancy Deckett, and one of my favorite songwriters, Bridget Tatum. And uh, we actually wrote it three years ago last month. Um, it was almost exactly the day we released the song, but we didn't plan it out that right that well because I had a blonde moment. Um, but we wrote it three years ago, and it was actually the day after the royal wedding back in 2018. So I was stalking Bridget on Instagram, actually, because if y'all don't know who she is, she's a big hit songwriter. Y'all definitely heard some of the songs she's written. Um, she's just absolutely amazing so it was an honor to be able to go in the room right with her and I was like we got to have some good ideas so I was like let's try to pick some stuff that she has said or let's see what's going on in her life and let's try to do something around her you know and uh, she had posted on her Instagram the night of the wedding you ain't a ro you ain't a princess until you marry a prince and I was like "Ooh, there's something there and we went in the next morning and I said, hey, well, I got this off your Instagram. Want to do something with this? And she was like, I am way ahead of you, sister. And uh, we ended up with this, you know, super fun, sassy song. And somebody asked me, you know, what I hope people would take away from the song. And I sat down and thought about, you know, we had a lot of fun. Yeah, we called her Dirt Road Debutante. We did all this stuff. But, 
you know, if there's anything somebody could take away from the song is to love who you are no matter where you come from and love you for you. Because me as a singer in the song, I'm talking about a girl that I loved and was one of my good friends from the beginning where she came from, you know? So it's just love who you are because no matter what, somebody loves you for that person. That's awesome. It's a very good message and a very powerful song. And <laughs> I got to say, vocally, if Winona Judd and Travis Tritt had a kid. Oh, that's you. I love it. Oh, my <laughs> God. You just made my day. I'm going to tear up. I love that. Oh, my gosh. I love Winona. I love Travis. Those are two of my favorites. Well, I mean, I that's, that's you. <laughs> thank you. Oh, my gosh. I a got to see Winona. Point. I got to see Winona back in December, and it was the first time I'd ever seen her live. And I was just, like, in tears the entire time because she's just so good. Like, it's ridiculous how good she is. And Travis, I've seen him several times. Um, one of my favorite performers, one of my favorite vocalists. Oh, my gosh. So, yes, I will claim that. Maybe, hopefully, I can meet them both at the same time, and we'll have a family picture. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be awesome. All right. Did you want to perform... Princess. Whatever you want me to do. Uh, go for it. Okay. Ready whenever you are. Go ahead. Take it away. Cool. You don't think you gotta cook. You don't think you gotta clean. You wanna paint your nails, sit around reading magazines <laughs> A selfie machine, self-claimed royalty Well, there's a difference between perception and reality on a hill girl let me be real you got a double wide trailer with some lay you to the deep <laughs> your daddy ain't no king of anything it don't count that your mama was the 88 soy bean queen you ain't a that you're a combination of Winona Judd and Travis Tritt. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness, yes. I love it. Love it. <laughs> that's awesome. Man, that's a good song. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'll put all the links in the description for where it's available. Awesome. And so the next song you wanted to um, talk about here is called Uncommon Man. So yes. go ahead and share the story behind Uncommon Man. So Uncommon Man was written a few years ago as well. We released this one a year ago in May, right smack dab at the very beginning of the um, 
pandemic. <laughs> we made that bold decision to do that. But when I, my friend Courtney Bumbacher came up to me with the idea, um, this is the first song we ever wrote together, and we write together all the time. I'm actually writing with her this afternoon when we get done here. Um, we write together all the time, and she came to me with this idea, though, for the first one and said, I want to write a song about my daddy, and I want to call it Uncommon Man. Nobody gets what I mean by that, but I think you might. And I said, oh, heck yes, I do. Because um, she's from a dairy farm in western New York, and I'm from a farm in western Kentucky. So we automatically um, bonded over both being farm kids. And so um, this wasn't one of those rots that took, you know, an hour because we wanted it to be absolutely perfect for our dads. That was our main goal, just to play it for them and have a song for our families. And uh, it took us a few rights and we finally got it. But it became just one of my family's favorite songs. Anytime my dad got to come to a show or got to be anywhere, he was like, will you play that song for me? And um, it started becoming, fans were requesting it too, which was really cool. And um, we came, fast forward to May 2020, we were getting ready to release a new single and I just had this gut feeling that it wasn't right. I was like, we don't need a sassy song. We don't need this right now. The world's shut down. Nobody knows what's happening. Like, we're all locked in our houses. So, um, we had a team meeting. I sent them over three or four songs. And I'd send them three sassy songs, but not as sassy as we had going. Because, you know, that's part of my brand. And uh, at the very end, I sent over a really rough work tape of Uncommon Man. And I was just like, by the way, I've had this for a few years. Let me know what y'all think. So the next day, we jumped on a Zoom, and my producer looked right at me, and he goes, what do you think the single is? And I was like, I ain't saying nothing, because I don't want what I say to be what none of y'all say. You know, I want to see y'all's opinions. And they just went one by one. There's about six of them on there, and they all went, Uncommon Man's a single. And I was like, oh, okay, good, because that's what I said, too. <laughs> but, um, so then we ended up dedicating it to all the essential employees, all the first line workers, um, the people who aren't necessarily always in the spotlight, but needed to be in, especially in the time of the world we were in. And I'm so thankful for how the song has been um, perceived and how the world has taken this and just ran with it. Um, we're almost at 700,000 streams completely independently no promotions no anything on that and you know we got top 24 on music row and like number 41 on billboard we were almost top 40 billboard um so we're very very thankful for this song and you know like i said we were just two farm girls that wrote it for our dads and we didn't know that it was going to get released and that all these things would happen with it but we're so thankful for it awesome you want to give us a little performance of that one as well yeah. Yeah, there we go. Here we go. There's no such thing as 40 hours, no working nine to five. Blood, sweat, and tears, praying to God, help me survive. Through droughts and floods and never ending days. In disaster years, he tries to keep his faith. He has holes in his jeans. He didn't buy them that away. And when he shakes your hand, you have his word and he'll take it to the grave. For he falls asleep at night, he reads the Bible by his bed. And he thanks the Lord for an everyday life. Of an uncommon man He does his best to support His kids and his wife Sometimes he might miss them But he still tucks them in at night Church and chores are still family affairs Yet to him no other life he has holes in his jeans He didn't buy them that away And when he shakes your hand You have his word And he'll take it to the grave Before he falls asleep at night He reads the Bible by his bed And he thanks the Lord For an everyday life Of an uncommon man It 
myself like a poor man's life. But he's richer than any millionaire. He has holes in his jeans. He didn't buy them that way. And when he shakes your hand, you have his word. And you'll take it to the grave Before he falls asleep at night He reads the Bible by his bed And he thanks the Lord for an everyday life Of an uncommon man An uncommon man Bravo! Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. We're yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, I think that a lot of people can definitely relate to that song. And we're very, um, you know, we get, we still get messages to this day. Um, people telling me the stories about their uncommon men, uncommon women. Yeah. Um, and uh, we actually, we were very thankful we got to do a lyric video for this song. Um, we didn't get to do a full production video, but we did a lyric video and we included pictures from all of my fans. Um, which was really cool. They all submitted. I think we, I mean, we ended up with like 150 submissions. Um, um, people with, you know, one person or multiple people. And the thing that I loved the video, I wish I could have included all the stories, though, that were sent. You know, from the granddads that, you know, retired from the military to come home and raise their kids. And... The, the single moms that work midnight so they can take care of their kids during the day. I just wish I could have included all those stories. And maybe one day we'll have a behind the lyric video video or something like that. But um, I was very thankful for everyone's stories and all the pictures that we got to include. And it just made the song even more special than it already was. Yeah, I would imagine incorporating the, uh, the fans' experiences is uh, particularly special. Mm-hmm. Definitely, definitely, and hopefully one day we'll be able to do that with that one. <laughs> well, and that's a kind of an emotional song, though. Like, how do you kind of hold it together? Because I don't know if I could do it. <laughs> so uh, I've sang it so many times now. Every song you get used to. Um, I still, I only have one song that I've ever written that I still can't make it through without crying. Um, and it was just a very, very emotional one. But um, so. I think, like, the first time I ever played that song for anybody other than my family, it was actually a family event, but what we do is my grandmother has a hayride um, every October, and we invite all the neighborhood, all the friends, all the family, everything, so there's probably 100 people there, and uh, I was singing it, and I got through it, my dad was sitting in the back tearing up, and then we had this farmer who's um, very well respected in our community. Um, I had never met him before, but he's worked with my daddy. And he came up to me and he goes, you don't know who I am, but, you know, you've been to my farm and all this stuff. And um, he's like, you sang that Uncommon Man song and I'm just sitting here bawling. That was my daddy. That's my son. That's how I hope my son looks at me. And he was like, you've got something special with that song, honey. Mm -hmm. You need to do something with it. And I was like, oh, wow. You know, because like I said, we just wrote it for our for our for our immediate families, for our dads. Um, and so the fact that somebody came up and said that to me the first time, it made it, um, it was already a super special song, but the fact that it was special to other people as well just made it that much more heartwarming and, you know, important to me. I would imagine so. Yeah, writing music that, uh, that touches people's lives is, uh, I, I would imagine, something very special. Yes, it definitely is. And, you know, that's what um, I had a mentor in the music industry early on. We still work with him. And he said, you know, they might not know it, but people come to shows and they listen to music to be changed. It's a subconscious thing. They don't realize that they're either looking for healing, they're looking for happiness or, you know, something that's going to help them. And that's what your job is as a musician. And so everything we try to do, we try to help somebody in some situation, um, whether it's see how somebody loves you for who you are or appreciating those who don't get appreciated as much and sometimes we have those fun ones that don't mean anything you just have fun with it but then those are still changing people because it's it's a laugh it's happiness it's getting them out of where they could have been when they walked in the show it's getting their mind off of everything outside the doors or outside of their car where they're listening to their music you know yep music is um 
Sometimes it's transformative and sometimes it's just fun. Exactly. <laughs> the third song um, that you're going to tell us about is uh, Hunting Season. Yeah, so this one, it's just a fun one. <laughs> Speaking um, of. This, I have to um, make sure everyone knows this is not a true story. None of us have lived through this. Um, but uh, it is true to the point where I was, I was hanging out with some friends one day and I was down in deep south Mississippi and somebody said something about their ex-wife's magazines kept coming to their house. And I was like, ooh, ooh, there's there's something there. Like, there's a song. And he, I think he had said something about, like, Cosmopolitan. And I was like, that's just going to be hard to say. And so I drove back to Mississippi. I drove back from Mississippi. And the next morning I was in Nashville writing with Cindy Torres, Scott Barrier, and Allie Colleen, who's an amazing art artist here in Nashville. Um, and I was like, I've got this idea. I don't know what it would be, though. And I want to... I was like, we can either write it for a guy to sing, and we could use Cosmopolitan or whatever. And they said, but there's three girls in the room right now. Let's write a girl song. And I was like, okay, cool. So Allie just looked at me and said, what magazines did your dad have when you were growing up? And I was like, I don't know, Field and Stream? It's about all we ever had. And they were like, okay, let's make up a story around Field and Stream magazine. I was like, okay, I like it. And so from there, Hunting Season was born. It's a fun song about a girl Finding her a new man is our PG version of it. <laughs> um, but we had a lot of fun writing this one. Um, this was just like Princess. I went home that night and I learned it. And I think I played it in a show that, that night. And I never do that. Um, I have to really like a song for me to do that. Well, ready for me to play? Go ahead. Take it away. Awesome. Lead. This is hurting season. <laughs> Carcass in a car. It's
right. All right. And moving on to just for fun, let's just get to know Dallas awesome. a little bit. Um, give me at least one item on your bucket list. Oh, um, I want to go to Italy. I've never been there. So that's a big one. Um, I got to go to the top one on my bucket list was Yellowstone and I got to go there. I've been there several times now, which is amazing. Um, so now the next one would definitely be Italy. And then after that, an Alaskan cruise. Okay. So oh my, I don't, I go big. I don't, I don't go like, oh, I just want to, oh, also the Grand Ole Opry. That's the main thing. But of course that's like, you know, fun life, like, you know, just traveling those, but life, life, Grand Ole Opry always. Absolutely. <laughs> Standing um, in a circle. Exactly. <laughs> um, okay. So <laughs> I love asking this question. Because I, I never know what people are going to say. Um, who's your celebrity crush? Oh, Lord. There's so many. <laughs> now, when I say that, now, when I say that, I mean, like, you're single, so-and-so is single. And you're like... Oh, they have to be single? I said if they if they were single. <laughs> if they were single. Um, we all have those that we were, we're like, why do you think that would be single? I mean, once again, I go big or go home. Chris Helmsworth. Okay. Or, you know, or like... The guy who plays Aquaman. I can't even pronounce his last Jason name. Jason Momoa. That one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That one. <laughs> <laughs> What's the worst thing you did when you were a kid? So my parents got us a really nice four-wheeler. Um, I think when I was eight and my brother was 14 or something like that. And where we're from, a big thing is you take your four-wheelers to the creek. And my dad, when we got the four-wheeler, was like, this is not one that goes to the creek. It took about two weeks. We had it in the creek. Um, but... It still works. It's still running. We never did anything bad to it. So I guess the bit worst thing would, you know, be we, we crossed the road and went to the creek. Sorry, Dad. Whoops. Oh, does he, he knows he, we did that. Oh, he does know? <laughs> he does know now. Okay. But he yeah. was like, I told you people not to do that. And it's like, well, is the four-wheeler messed up? No, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that would probably be the worst thing. I don't know. <laughs> so what would you say is the riskiest or most adventurous thing you've done? Hmm. <clears throat> Riskiest or most adventurous? I mean, I moved to Nashville when I was 15. I feel like that's one of the big yeah. things. And, you know, most kids don't. I mean, like, because I, uh, I was a competitive soccer player my entire life um, up until I was, like, 13 or 14. And, you know, we were talking about it earlier. You know, most people don't make that decision. I mean, I had to make that decision when I was – I literally had a coach. And when I was 13, tell me I had to choose between soccer or music. And I was just like, well – you made me mad to music. Um, so, you know, I went all in. I mean, we started coming here when I was 11, but from the time I was 13, I've been 100% into this. Um, so, I mean, you know, I was homeschooled. I left all my friends behind, and this is what I wanted to do. So I guess that would be the biggest risky thing I've done. <laughs> that's. I mean, that's a big one. Yeah, most people yeah. don't do that as an adult. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, I'm trying to think of like something that's like not music related that I've done that, you know, I don't know. Music's probably the biggest thing I've ever done. No, no, that'll work. I think that's a good one. Yeah. All right. And moving on to could you not? So just tell the world what whatever it is that just gets under your skin. Tell the world could you not? Oh, there's so many. I'm a very, I have a lot of pet peeves. <laughs> I don't want to sound like I'm complaining. Um, biggest thing, you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm a country girl. I mean, like, I come from the middle of nowhere. So moving to a city, definitely traffic. I know you said earlier, a lot of people have traffic related ones. I mean, I just, my biggest thing is I can't stand rubberneckers. I don't understand, like, yes, a terrible thing has happened, but we can just keep on driving before more terrible things happen behind you. <laughs> That's, um, so that, and then, you know, I just, oh, my biggest thing is I cannot stand when people are rude to waiters and waitresses. I just, it hurts me, and I feel so bad, because I know these people are working their butts off, and so, you know, just be kind, be gracious, you know, they're, they're wiping your table after you've made a mess, you know, you could just say thank you. Um, so that's probably my biggest pet peeve, actually, is when people are, are rude to people in service or, um, you know, those kind of things, because could you not just be a nice person? <laughs> <laughs> 
No, I, I, I get it. I similar here. I don't, I don't like it when people are rude to, to, you know, people that are actually trying to make their day better. <laughs> exactly. I don't like when people are rude to anybody at all, but the worst is when you're sitting there with somebody and they're just like, so snippy to waitresses and waiters. It's just, oh, it hurts my stomach. <laughs> I think that most of the times that's just a power dynamic. They're like, this person is doing something for me, so I have the control. And it's like, mm, no, that's a good opportunity for you to just be polite. Exactly. Exactly. I don't think I could be a waitress. I'd be that person that gets fired for spitting people's food. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I wouldn't. I, I'd I'm, want to. I, I don't think I could do it just because I'm not coordinated enough. Like, they mm -hmm. all the stuff that they carry, and, like, I don't know how they do it because I can't. Oh, gosh. Yeah. I mean, I would break so many things. I'd owe the restaurant money. Yeah, that's it. I have friends that they work at this place. It's three stories and there's only one kitchen and there's no elevator. Uh, I think they might've gotten an elevator now, but they have to do stairs. And I'm like, I don't know how you do it. And they're like, we have runners. They're trained for that. We don't have to do it. I'm like, okay, I can do your job because all you're doing is taking their order at this point. <laughs> but I don't, I couldn't carry it up steps and oh mm -hmm. gosh, no, I couldn't do that part either. Nope. <laughs> all right, Dallas, those are all the questions that I have for you. The floor is yours. Whatever you got coming up, uh, anything else you want to mention, go ahead. Awesome. Yeah, well, thank you so much for having me, first of all. This has been super fun. Um, and, you know, just uh, we're trying to book as many gigs as possible coming up. Um, we had several up down in the Dallas area, actually, that they have been canceled. So we're working on redoing those. We're going to be playing in St. Louis, um, Chicago area, things later this year, and hopefully we'll be getting back down um, in the south and hopefully soon. But, you know, the best way to keep in touch with me is DallasRemington.com. That's Dallas like the city in Texas and Remington like the shotgun or the curling iron, whichever one you choose because they're spelled the exact same. Millennium. Anyways, you can go to DallasRemington.com. From there, it's got the links to my music, um, my shows, all my social media, all those things. And um, make sure you go sp stream the heck out of Princess. We're trying to blow this song up. I am completely independent, and we want to have our first number one as an independent artist with this one. So, y'all blow it up and call Country Radio and start requesting it. All right, Dallas. And I will put all those links and stuff in the description as well. Make sure you guys do awesome. check out Princess because it is awesome, as you just heard. <laughs> <laughs> and Dallas, it was so much fun having you. Thanks for joining today. Yay. Thank you so much for having me. This was a lot of fun. You have a great day. You too. Bye. Bye. Okay, everybody. Thank you so much for checking out this episode. As mentioned, the link to Dallas's website will be in the description. And be sure to stream Princess and check out the video for that that's now on YouTube. And also call your local radio stations and request that they play it as well. If you're watching this on YouTube, give it a thumbs up. If you're listening on a podcast platform, make sure you follow or subscribe. And also, leave a review. Let me know how I'm doing. Alrighty. See you next time. Bye.